Susanna Syrofman of Dovetail Design Strategists, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have a huge architecture and design festival called Modernism Week. But it's actually 11 days long. It's grown every year. For the last five years, U.S. Modernist has been at Modernism Week, and this year was fantastic. It was so much fun. Over the spring and summer, we will bring you interviews from the U.S. Modernist Compound, meaning we were poolside at the very hip Hotel Skylark, with nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers, plus our special guests. Today, for instance, in the first of two shows on modernist interiors, George Smart meets two of the organizers of the Alexander Girard exhibition at the Palm Springs Museum of Art, Christine Marvin and Michaela O'Connor Abrams. And later, he talks with former chief curator Catherine Huff. This was my second time at Modernism Week, and this year I got to check out the famous Bridge of Thighs. Oh, and yes. Check it <laughs> off of my bucket list. Turns out that Tell Palm, them the story. Yeah, Palm Springs has a nudist colony, um, don't we all? <laughs> this one happens to have property that it expanded to. It now spans both sides of a street. And so, how are the nudists going to cross the road? That sounds like a joke. Uh, kind of. Um, well, they built a walkway over the street, and it's shielded. So you can be nude walking over the regular city street uh, and keep your privacy. But it got a nickname, and it, the nickname is The Bridge of Thighs, with apologies <laughs> to Venice and everywhere else. Yes. But, Many apologies to Venice. Yes, I got to drive under it uh, this year on a tour. It was really a great week, Tom. If you are into mid-century modern architecture, this is really the the top place in the world to go every February. You just can't imagine so much great architecture all in the same place. Faithfully restored, most of it. And so many houses open for tours. Both bus tours, which will take you around and you can visually see things, or tours where you can go in the houses, or tours where you can get on a bicycle and ride through neighborhoods, or tours that focus especially on photography. It's all there, and it's great. When modern-day Jedi Knights use the Force, they don't use it to go to Tatooine. (laughs) They land inside Arthur Elrod's massive house in Palm Springs, which was featured in the movie Diamonds Are Forever. Modernism Week is a joyous, all-you-can-view festival of mid-century architecture, lectures, martinis, art galleries, shopping, nonprofit benefit events, architecture documentary premieres, amazing parties and incredible houses, brilliantly curated exhibits like the ones we'll talk about today, and much more. For me, one highlight is walking downtown. When you go through Palm Canyon Drive and go into the downtown, it's just delightful, I guess is the best way to express it. I mean, you've got these cute little galleries next to nice restaurants, next to crazy little stores. And of course, all of this on both sides of the road is framed by the Palm Springs Walk of Stars, which is like the Hollywood Walk of Stars. But you can see these stars in the concrete, different people that have contributed to the life and fame and celebrity of Palm Springs. It's just fascinating. If you want to go with us in February 2021 and stay at the U.S. Modernist Compound, complete with our own swanky pool and some of the best breakfast and rooms in town, please email me at george at usmarnish.org. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by nichiha.com slash usmarnish and by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In our ongoing mythology, modernist realtor Angela Roll dated Harry Potter at age 17 as she attended Le Corbusier High School That's just down the road from Hogwarts. They never played each other in soccer, but their proms were legendary, particularly the year they did Stairway to Heaven. (laughs) 
<laughs> Although ridiculed by architecture students for dating a magician, she learned how to conjure up the slightly tipsy ghost of Mies van der Rohe and aced all the exams, which means she became valedictorian. Now, she's one of the few real estate agents with formal architecture training, giving practical advice to buyers and sellers, plus she knows what wizards like to eat. <laughs> Angela Roll is your magic spell for modernism. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or call her at 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. I'm George Smart. One of the highlights of being at Modernism Week this year was the Alexander Girard exhibition at the Palm Springs Museum of Art. Girard was an architect, interior designer, furniture designer, industrial designer, and textile designer, particularly known for his work with Herman Miller. Later, he created fabrics for designers George Nelson and Charles and Ray Eames that have become classic elements of modernist furniture. Gerard was the genius behind the rebranding of Braniff Airlines, a huge marketing campaign which brought color and style to the flying experience for the first time. By 1962, Gerard had collected an art collection with over 100,000 pieces, many of which are in the Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Coming up, I talk with Christine Marvin of Marvin Windows and Doors, the company backing the Girard exhibition in Palm Springs, and exhibition organizer Michaela O'Connor Abrams, former Dwell CEO and now founding partner with Mocha Plus in San Francisco. Later on, I visit with Catherine Huff, former chief curator at the Palm Springs Museum of Art. Let's go now poolside in sunny Palm Springs. I remember back in the day when architects had a wall in their office of notebooks that would come from various materials suppliers. I mean, literally a wall of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of notebooks, all three ring spiral binders. And big as life on that wall on my dad's architectural office was Marvin. That was the name that I saw every time I came into the office. It was just like, boom, right there. And there were some other companies, which we won't name. But yours was the one that I remembered from all this because he was specking this stuff all the time for different buildings. I mean, this is a company that's endured forever. When did it start? It started in 1912 in northwestern Minnesota in a town called Warroad, Minnesota, where we are still headquartered today. Is that near the War Road International Airport? Uh, funny you should bring that up. In fact, it is. Mind you, we're six miles from the border, and uh -huh. that's why it's called International. Okay, but. okay. Great, great. Who <laughs> was your grandfather that was in this? It was actually my great-grandfather okay. who started it in 1912 as uh, Marvin Lumber and Cedar Company, doing just that, right? Mm -hmm. Lumber mm -hmm. and Cedar. But it was my grandfather who, when he came back to the, to the family business after college, evolved it from a barn sash company into what we now know as the window and door side of the company. And quite honestly, the window and door side is, is the company today. Sure. Now, was it always windows and doors, or was it just windows at one point? That's amazing you brought that up. It started out as windows, and it was windows for a long time. Yeah. I, I, and yeah. still, until the doors came along, and then we did some brand updates to make sure that doors were included in that. And today it's windows and doors. And doors. And when did doors come on approximately? Prior to 1981, but it was in 1981 where we built a facility in Ripley, Tennessee, where a lot of the doors are now manufactured. Uh, but it's, it started there. Okay. I would love to have been at that staff meeting. It's like, hmm, what else can we be doing besides these windows? It's a natural extension. <laughs> right. it's, it's probably what I, I wouldn't call it a wild idea, but it was, it was pretty fitting. And Ripley, Tennessee, is that your only door plant or are there multiple ones? Multiple. Today, uh, we manufacture doors at many of our facilities. We have 15 across the country and, and things have evolved since then. Although our signature line of doors, the beautiful wood window and doors that many of us know today are still manufactured there. But it's no longer just the patio doors. It's that plus those really big, beautiful scenic doors that we see in, in design today. So I have this fantasy where I want to have in this building that I have, mm -hmm. I want to have this very unique kind of glass enclosure like I might see at the Sears Tower 
or the Willis Tower that I could maybe nestle into. I could maybe put a throw pillow in the corner or something like that. But no one I know even thinks this is an remotely possible. What do you think about that? I... The fact that you brought that up today, I feel like this meeting is destiny. You may not know this, uh-huh. but a, a few weeks ago, we did debut at the International Builder Show, what we call Sky Cove. And it's a beautiful, light-filled space where you can nestle with pillows and loved ones. All right. That's, that's really great. And, and how big are these little coves? Are they any size or how are they? they? I mean, they can become very substantial up to, you know, six feet tall or up to nine feet wide. So it can definitely fit a, a full family and some pets, too. Can I open it up as an attraction and sell tickets like for people to come to try out my Sky Cove? You can do anything in your own home. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Okay, so I have another one. Sure. So, you know, the whole ethos of... Mid-century modernism mm-hmm. was about light. Yes. And, and you're a big light company, really. I mean, you're giving mm-hmm. access to light all the time. So I find that around 1970, people really got out of this whole idea of skylights and atriums and yes. courtyards and things like that. I'd love to see that come back. What's happening in that area? It is coming back. And there's no question in my mind. We've spent the past few years trying to understand modern living How are people wanting to live, and not just in Minnesota or even the United States, but internationally? So we've traveled to Tokyo, we've traveled to Copenhagen, Mm -hmm. and what we're beautiful place. And what we're finding, though, is that bringing the elements in, so immersing in view and light and air, is a really healing and desirable thing right now. We live in very very, very digitally connected, busy world. And home has new meaning. It's a place to come and recharge to, you know, contemplate even your your greater purpose in life, right? Yeah. To become rejuvenated. And the elements that enable you to do that or or provide that experience and space in a home are those things. And we feel that we're in such a fortunate position to be able to think about those in new ways to enable architects to design differently for, um, you know, builders to build and install differently and for homeowners to essentially live the, the way they want to live in their in their homes. I can tell you as someone who interacts with the general non-architect public a lot is that people just, they, they want that, but they really don't know how to find it or access it for real. I mean, we all have Google and we can mm-hmm. search for keywords, but sometimes this is not just a keyword thing. You have to be at the right place at the right time to see it or experience it. Or walk into a building and, you know, wander over to somebody and goes like, where'd that come from? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and a lot of time what we find is that people might admire something in someone else's home or at a hotel or in another building and say, oh, this is so great. It just makes me feel great. And then they stop short of thinking that they could actually incorporate that into their home. Like somehow everything else somewhere else is futuristic and not applicable. And I think one of the things that modern living really it shows is that you can certainly do that. You're not sacrificing privacy. You're not sacrificing the use of resources. You're really able to enjoy a space to its fullest and be able to have what you admire someplace else if you work with architects and designers and explain how you live. Because ultimately, that's really what modern means. It's it's appropriate for our time and our lives. And that, of course, is very individual. What may be right for me may not be right for the next person, but it is what I want to create because it's my home. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that we've always admired about Marvin is that that's been part of the whole purpose mm-hmm. in, in the way that they explain creating and imagining better ways to live. Um, and that becomes their innovation platform, if you will. So we hope that more people think about how they can create that for themselves, not admire it someplace else. But I also think that we're, we live in a time now where design has become more accessible in a lot of ways. To think about the platforms of Pinterest and Howes 
and how you can start to explore style that inspires you or helps achieve the way that you want to live. And you talk to architects and designers to, to today and that those images become a form of communication. That image inspires someone and it creates them to feel something they want in their home. And oftentimes there's not the language behind it or um, your ability to actually say this, it's this, but it's this feeling. And that's where architecture and design can come in Mm -hmm. to help give the language by way of form. Absolutely. We have a little company, I don't know if you've ever visited, in Carborough, North Carolina, called Fitch Lumber. They've not been around as long as your company has been around, but pretty close. I'd say probably 60 or 70 years. And they sell Marvin. They do, yes. Yes. And they hosted one of our parties about a, a year ago that we do every month. So what was really neat is, is over in the corner where they had some of the windows and doors, I, they also had some chairs set up. So you could sit in the model in a way and kind of imagine what it would be like if it was your living room or your dining room or bedroom to see how this vibe affected you. Because if you're just walking around anything, it's not the same experience of being in your house day to day. You have to kind of be the way you are in the house. And it was really cool for people to experience the the new line that you have for modern by just sitting down in a folding chair right there in the middle of it all. I love, and I wasn't there for that, and I've heard so much about it. And what I love about what they did is they created an emotional experience. Yeah. It wasn't about viewing something in form. It was helping people imagine and use their imagination to envision what it could mean for them and so i think that's a it's a beautiful concept and people i mean we're in an experience economy right now right designed experiences are everything you guys have brought a great gift to palm spring which is the exhibition on alexander gerard so i want to talk about that michaela give us a quick little overview about gerard because not everybody knows who he is or what he's done okay well it is in fact an exhibition that everybody must see this is one city the last one in the united states on the tour that started at the vitra museum and has moved around the country Um, 700 objects from Alexander Girard, who really, and I'm so oversimplifying, but in the interest of time, brought international design, color, texture, of feeling that you could have something that was very modern and, and always a nod to modernity, he felt, in the folk art as an example. And he was given credit, and still is, for bringing that to modern that had previously been much more what I'll think of as Bauhaus influenced, Mm -hmm. right? Extremely austere. People will say, oh, you mean glass and steel. Well, it wasn't all that. But Gerard was just so the rule breaker, so the disruptor of that time in an important way. And so much so that brands like Braniff Airlines and restaurants brought his architecture and design to What was the slogan for Braniff, not the plain plain? Not the plain plain. Yeah. Right. I mean, I I remember seeing those as a kid, you know, going off and seeing them at the airports, and they were just magical. Well, in fact, we were talking about that in the Marvin Conversation series, which is at the museum all week this week. And the fact that when you look at the interior of the planes, that they have fabulous photography as part of this, and how the flight attendants were dressed and the lighting, you fast forward to 2007, it's exactly what Richard Branson did with Virgin America. With Virgin, uh, mm-hmm. yes. Had the beautiful colors, very Gerard-like. The white leather seats in first class, the in-flight entertainment system, the purple lighting, the beautifully dressed flight attendants, men and women that were not folding their arms saying they're there for your safety, but what else can we do to make your trip better? And it's it's really incredible that fully... 50 years later, Richard Branson We're getting would some say, of that back, hey, yes. this is not new. This right. is just what people forgot about. Gerard was a real renaissance man. He was an architect. He designed some houses. He was in industrial design. He was in commercial products. I mean, what were some of the range of activities that he did? Well, I mean, you can not only do I mention restaurants and the airline and fashion, but uh, tableware and beautiful things that other people thought of just as decoration um, and adornments and would collect them from all over the world. This exhibition moves on after it leaves Palm Springs and goes to Mexico City. Many of his 
pieces are from Oaxaca and Jalisco and other places in Mexico that he so much admired what had been more than a century old then of beautiful pieces and fabric and color that he felt were the epitome of modernity, actually. So this exploration of his was so celebrated in everything he did. La Fonda del Sol, the restaurant in New York, sadly Mm -hmm. no longer there, but still famous for the matchbook collection that is a print and people license it to do myriad things. The last standing restaurant is the Compound in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where there's a beautiful... Uh, called a rendition of his conversation pit, which was made famous in the Miller House in Columbus, By Indiana. In Columbus, Indiana. Exactly. And so you have there the bar that is still the sunken experience that changes the whole way the customer feels about their relationship with the bartender. So I could go on. It was like there was no limit. There wasn't, gee, this is where the creativity, the inspiration, the innovation stops. Were he alive today, I have no doubt that he'd be doing many of the most important public spaces and buildings and continue uh, to make his mark. Well, I have a little Gerard news. Last week, our archivist staff just discovered a Gerard project in Michigan down the street from his house, but in a Minoru Yamazaki-designed house. He's the one that Mm. designed the World Trade Center. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he and Gerard were pals during that time that they lived together in uh, Gross Point, I believe it was. That's right. And Gerard did the interiors of a Yamazaki house, which has now fallen to the fourth owner. And she's calling me up, trying to give me all this information. I'm like, oh, wow, what great oh, timing that's incredible. this is. So we got another piece of the archive there to put the story together. To that end, George, the um, really last standing, fully preserved Gerard home in Gross Point, mm-hmm. um, the Luberas were here with us for oh, the nice. Marvin, Marvin Conversation Series, and Deborah Luberakowski was our opening speaker of the Marvin, Marvin Conversation Series about Gerard's architecture, and her book is for sale at camp and at many bookstores, but it's really so amazing to hear the story about going to a place like Gross Point, very traditional revival architecture and in comes what was thought of as incredibly disruptive. But once it got to be a part of the landscape, it was so celebrated because it was anything but disruptive. It, Mm -hmm. in fact, was so much more gentle on the environment than anything else around it. I mean, these were the men and women, mostly men, who were doing things that we now have names for, like green building and sustainable design and uh, avoiding climate change or whatever it is. I mean, they were doing all of this way, way early, not so much directly, but just in the way that they were trying to cite these things for living. Absolutely. Pretty incredible. Well, it's about natural living, and that's what they brought to life with their, with their function and form and use. Well, also that many people think, well, modern, you know, is somehow stripping away tradition and heritage, and it's anything but that. And Gerard's very well known for his, um, and it's a piece in the exhibition when he writes about in his quote that we do not need to strip away the past. Mm -hmm. We just need to draw from it and, and understand how important it really is to the design of our time. Now, we can't always get into houses at the time that we want, but I know that Marvin, over the years, has been involved in several iconic projects around the country. What are some of the places that people could go to that they could see Marvin Windows in action, either more recently or from the past? The one that comes to mind, and I know this is top of mind because we are sitting here in Palm Springs, is the Axiom Desert House right in our backyard, designed by the Turkels. And it is... Two, three years old now? Three. About three, three years. years. Yeah, yeah. What I love about it, though, is not just because it has it has Marvin, right, but I do think it's a lovely execution of it, is that it's a modern-day architectural expression of that captures modern living. Absolutely. So you were telling us about the Joel Turkel House, and I also want to know about uh, commercial buildings. What are some of the big projects that Marvin has been involved in? There's a number from universities to... One of the commercial project, and then with it, an application is truly, you know, breathtaking, and that it captures the the art that goes into what we make. 
So we make modern windows and we know people are familiar with with Marvin in general. But one dimension of our company that has also helped shape us as a company over the years is we're known for craftsmanship. And so we can take any sort of challenge brought forth in historic replication or else or in other words, even thinking about large curtain walls and how can we create that structurally and, you know, achieve vision of what we're the architect is imagining. And so we're, we're proud of that, that breadth and that skill set from the historic detail to, you know, the modern day window walls. You know, in, in churches, it's really some of those windows and the placement of the windows that creates whatever spiritual experience you're trying to put together. I mean, you're trying to evoke some sort of higher power, whatever you want to call it. And, and usually you're, you're aiming towards the sky or the outside because usually higher powers don't hang around indoors for some reason. They're out there <laughs> waiting for us. So, That's why we're all looking up. I think. Yes, exactly. That's really great. And I think that if people go to Carnegie Mellon and see that, that would be a fun experience. Let me add that an architecture firm also well-known in the Valley but known internationally is uh, Marmol Radziner. Oh, sure. Leo Marmol and Rod Radziner. I had the opportunity to travel with one of the designers in Christine Marvin's uh, design lab, which is a relatively new group at Marvin, looking at where we three to five years from now. Yes. And Candela, who's an amazing person, we introduced her to Ron Radziner, and she was talking about some of the things coming up in the future that had not yet been revealed, have not yet been revealed. And I thought his response was so interesting. He said, wow, I love this, but don't stop making the gorgeous wood casements and windows. We love those. Don't yes. think of those as traditional Think of those as so essential to the feeling of the environment, which is synonymous with modern. I think that's right. And I think it goes to the point that modern is not a style and it also it should be warm. It should have personality. And wood does that in an incredible way. Absolutely. And in a lot of what you would consider modern design or modern living or homes, you find the use of wood and it extends into windows and doors and a desirability to have that live there in that space. Well, you know, Nancy Sinatra, from time to time, doesn't want to sing These Boots Are Made For Walking Mm -hmm. anymore because it's an old song now. But it's the one that everybody still loves. And she was just performing, I think, a day or two ago to Standing Room Only to preserve the Plaza Theater downtown Mm -hmm. and ended the show with that. So, yes, please keep making those windows that everybody loves, (laughs) the greatest hits of Marvin. We talk about (laughs) uh, what we make as an evolution and not a start stop and not throwing away the bat pass, but taking the best of our history and moving it forward in new ways. So I wanted to ask this one last question. I'm sure this has been discussed at some staff meeting at your company over time, because this Mm -hmm. is my first thought when I saw the Marvin catalog. Have you ever considered hiring as your spokesperson for the brand? Do you know who I'm going to say? I actually have no idea, George. Marvin the Martian. Oh, my oh my gosh. I mean, who could be better than that? With the helmet and the little black face, and he could be inside all these exciting buildings, soaking in the cosmic rays from his home planet. The thing I appreciate about you most <laughs> is your imagination. <laughs> well, that is part of the Marvin purpose, right? Creative Creativity. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Marvin was a very creative Martian. He was always mm-hmm. trying to outsmart Bugs Bunny. Mm-hmm. But as a kid, that's who I thought was in this notebook of the three ring binder. This was Marvin the Martian. Can I ask one thing on that binder? Yeah. What color was it? I want to think it was yellow. Mm-hmm. That's one reason why I believe it, it stood out on all of those the bookcases, right, and, and the racks and architectural firms is, you know, we talk about Gerard and um, his folk art and color, and it evokes joy, and it really distracts the eye. And I think that's the one of the reasons you may remember, I don't know, yeah. is that bright yellow bright binder. Yellow. I mean, I should not remember a yellow binder from that long ago, but I do. And I'm grateful you do. <laughs> Thank you both for coming by. This has been great. Thank Thank you, you. George. That was George Smart with Christine Marvin and Michaela O'Connor Abrams. George has got the former curator of the Palm Springs Museum of Art lined up next. But first, a moment of reflection from Nietzscheha. Your house can easily achieve any 
exterior look and any color. Wood. Concrete. Your house loves feeling this good. And you love feeling this good. Nichia, Nichia. Nichia, Nichia. Say it with me. Nichia. Advanced engineering. Nichia, Nichia. Durability. Textures. Finishes. And colors. Visit Nichia.com slash US Modernist. Nichia, Nichia. Nichia. That's in. George's next guest is Catherine Huff, former chief curator at the Palm Springs Museum of Art. They're poolside at the U.S. Modernist Compound in Palm Springs. Well, um, I feel like I grew up at the museum. Um, I did recently retire mm-hmm. as a chief curator after I was uh, been working there for 42 years. Wow. So 42 years, same job. And then I joke because... I had a wedding anniversary recently, and I say, 40 years, same man, 42 years, same job. Okay. That's pretty good. You are loyal. (laughs) (laughs) That's on your merit badge that you're wearing right here. Right. How did you start at the museum? Were you just a a visitor, or were you an intern, or how did it all come about? Okay. Well, to be very truthful, I had my eye on two things. Your husband, was he part of it? I had my eye on Greg, <laughs> who I'd met in college at Long okay. Beach State University, and I was studying interior design. I had my eye on the museum that was under construction, but then I got a job with Arthur Alrod, who was a famous interior designer. Very famous. And so I was right out of college, and I was very brave to just, you know, make a cold call and call him up and take my portfolio into Arthur Alrod, and uh, and then he hired me. And so I moved to Palm Springs, and I worked with, with Arthur Alrod for a couple of years, and then Arthur was killed in a car accident. Mm-hmm. And he had been consulting with the design of the interiors of our new museum. At that time, it was called the Palm Springs Desert Museum. Okay. And so I decided to make a career shift from interior design to go into museum studies and exhibition design. So I I went back to school and got my master's, and then I got a job at the museum. So I got a job at the museum, and then Greg married me two years later, and um, that's that's my beginning. Now, most people who are not in the arts world know Arthur Elrod from his house, which was in one of the James Bond movies, uh, Diamonds Are Forever, I think. Yes. Where bikini-clad security yeah. guards go after Sean Connery. Right. But he was a fantastic designer. He designed interiors. He also did some houses, I believe, as well, all throughout the valley and across the United States. Tell us a little bit about Arthur. So, so Arthur, he started in actually San Francisco, but mm-hmm. then he had some clients here in Palm Springs, And he was well-known in the 1960s, mostly, late 50s, all through the 60s, and then the early 70s until his his death in 1974. So Arthur had this wonderful international style, and he was able to do commercial businesses like Johnson Publishing Company in Chicago was a very big job that he did uh, for the uh, publisher's business offices, but then he also did wonderful residences. And he really broke away from traditional kind of Hollywood Regency style furniture to really sleek modern contemporary in which the the integration of architecture was um, put together with the interior design. So it was a real melding of interiors and architecture. And he worked with 
quite a few architects here in town. Mm -hmm. All the major guys, uh, yeah. Like Cody and and Stuart Williams and others. So Steve Chase. Steve Chase. I, I met Steve when I worked at Arthur Elrod's in uh, 1973, and that's how I began my friendship with uh, Steve Chase all those years ago. And when I went to the museum recently, this week, I looked up, mm-hmm. and there's the Steve Chase wing. So how did that come about? Mm-hmm. So Steve started his own business, his own studio in 1980 after... Uh, Arthur, Running Arthur's uh, business after, for a while. After right. being a partner with Hal Broderick and working there. Then he started his own business in 1980. And then this was a real, this was the opulent 80s. Mm-hmm. And Steve really took off with his international design. He had been inspired and kind of trained a bit by Arthur Elrod and then launched his own studio and his own team of uh, design associates. So he was doing jobs all over the, the world, and he started collecting art. He always was a collector, early on, kind of folk art, artisan, arts and crafts, and then mm-hmm. he went into fine art. He often worked with major collectors that were building homes, and he was doing the interior design. So he became interested in collecting art himself. Okay. And with my friendship with, with Steve, he said... I'm going to build an art collection for myself, and you're going to help me choose those artists and the artworks, and then I'm going to leave it all to the museum, and we're going to build the Steve Chase Art Wing. Yeah. So he did all that. Um, Unfortunately, he passed away in 1994. The Steve Chase Art Wing opened in 1996. Okay. But before he passed away, he collaborated with Stuart Williams, the architect, to build that third floor and, you know, worked on the designs with Stu and they went back and forth, of course, with the museum. Right. And and Steve left some seed money so we could build that wing. He left a, a one and a half million dollars okay. as seed money. And then he left his collection of 132 contemporary artworks. And then we did some fundraising and raised enough money to be able to build... Uh, that beautiful Steve Chase Wing, and uh, there are many of the works that Steve donated on exhibition, but of course the museum rotates the collection. Right. Uh, with, and one thing that really was significant in um, my career at the museum and knowing Steve, building that Steve Chase Wing really launched the museum into another realm of excellence it showed we were more serious about collecting and exhibiting contemporary art. At that time, we had also been a natural science museum. And oh, I didn't know that. We, that was, we changed our name. Uh, it used to be the Palm Springs Desert Museum. And it was a museum that started in 1938 as a museum about the desert. Right. The desert animals, the, the plants, and the Native Americans mm-hmm. of the desert. And then art was introduced in the uh, late 1960s, and we had some very important collectors at that time that helped change our focus to art, and that was like Joseph Hirshhorn of the Hirshhorn Museum of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., sure. Mm -hmm. So the museum started collecting art, and then Steve left his art collection to the museum, and that encouraged other important collectors to donate artworks to the museum and, and, and help us grow into what we are today. One thing I like about the museum is similar to the Guggenheim in New York is that you can take the little elevator up to the top and meander your way around, sort of in a circle, I guess, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. making your way back down to the ground floor and see all of the permanent exhibitions and some of the temporary ones that are in place. And there's this beautiful wall of donors Mm -hmm. that you have, which I think is the most nice looking of any of the ones I've ever seen. It's all lit up from behind with the glass and so forth. Yeah. And then behind that, you have the special exhibitions, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, we have two wings of special exhibitions. And then we have the the back of the museum to the, the west and upstairs in the Steve Chase wing is generally the permanent collection. However, you know, the museum changes all the time with new and exciting exhibitions and, and new works coming in. So it's constantly changing, that's for sure. 
Now, I've talked with several directors of the museum mm-hmm. over time, and it all seems to come back to that at some point they got to stay in the Frey House up on the mountain above the museum for some period of time, a month, two months, six months. So I guess my question is, how do I apply to be director of the museum? Because that's really my goal is to live up there. Well, uh, Janice Lyle, mm-hmm. uh, who was our former director, she's now at the Sunny Sunnylands. Lands, yep. So Janice lived up there for uh, actually for a couple of years. Yeah. But, you know, it's a very small space. 800 square feet, right? <laughs> yes, very, very small. There's a big boulder, you know, in the middle of the living room and in the middle of your bedroom and the middle of the dining room. And who comes through in those little boulders? Well, lizards and snakes. And when Albert Frey lived there, he had some pets that would visit him, a wild animal pets. But I love visiting the Frey house, but I wouldn't want to live there because you know why? Why? Well, the bed faces the east, and it's this big, big window, and the sun comes up very early in the morning, and it's right in your eyes the minute it comes up. So if you're an early riser, then living in the Frey house would be a good idea. Well, um, (laughs) I'd be willing to risk that because I have an eye mask. So I can just pop that baby on, and I am just great. But I make it a point to visit the house every time I come. And um, there's a little love seat, I guess I would yes. call it, concrete love seat. At the end of the house, you can sit and look right. down over the whole canyon, all the way out to the airport and yes. beyond, yes. which is terrific. Yeah, and Albert Frey used to sit there in the morning. He had a pet chuckawalla. Do you know what a chekawala is? It's like a big lizard, okay. a big reptile. And they're, they're very friendly uh, once they become familiar with their yeah. surroundings. So, so Albert had a, a chekawala that was his kind of pet. And he would sit there on that concrete looking to the, to the east and uh, be friendly. And then he had a, a roadrunner, too, that came around that uh, he fed hamburger to okay. the roadrunner. Did it go beep, beep? Because that's what I think road runners do. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> There's quite a few of them around. Yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah? I don't think I've ever seen a live mm-hmm. road runner. Oh, yeah. No, they're wonderful. We love them. They're plentiful. I will have to look around for that. They kind of hang around. Um, we're close to the mountain mm-hmm. where the boulders are and close to, to the mountains. When I was working in my office, I would see them uh, against the museum building. Okay. Often running around looking for lizards. So now that you've retired, what are you up to? Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be retired, and I have many volunteer positions and some projects that I'm working on. Um, my new, most new volunteer job is I'm on the City of Palm Springs Historic Site Preservation Board. Okay. So I'm delighted to be among those that that review homes for uh, historic classification, and that's been very exciting. And, and because I've lived in Palm Springs so many years, I'm very familiar with the, uh, the changes that have happened in, in the historic properties, and so it's something I'm very interested in being involved in, and it's very fulfilling. Okay. So that's, that's one of my biggest jobs. I'm also working with Janice Lyle at Sunnylands on a project they're organizing an Agam show, Israeli artists, Agam. Okay. I've written an essay for their book that they're publishing to accompany the exhibition. When our museum opened uh, in 1976, we opened the museum with an Agam exhibition. And Mrs. Annenberg was the president of our board of trustees. And the Annenbergs collected quite a few Agams. So this exhibition will be somewhat of a collaboration between Sunnylands and the Palm Springs Art Museum because they're showing the agams that the Annenbergs collected and they're borrowing agams that our museum collected. Okay. And so that's September 2020. Okay. So that's a fun uh, project I'm working on. Well, that's pretty exciting. Now, historic designation in Palm Springs, does that have any legal teeth whatsoever? Like, does it does it preserve a house or keep you from destroying it? Or does it do anything other than just bestow an honor on a house? Yeah, and there are different classifications, mm-hmm. you know, like class one, two, three, four, and five. And the highest 
designation does want you not to change the exterior mm -hmm. if it's uh, classified as a historic property based on a style, whether it's mid-century modern or a Spanish revival or, or some other classification. You're asked not to change the exterior of the uh, the property interior is is not a consideration, right. but but it does protect historic properties from being torn down, like the Maslin uh, Neutra House was torn down in Rancho Mirage right, years the ago. Right, the famous one, yes. So this really uh, was a wake up call for so many of the communities in our desert to look at our historic properties and protect them by not having them torn down or altered. So it's, it's a classification that protects the property. But does it have legal enforcement? Like if, if, you, if I have a house mm -hmm. and it gets designated at the highest level and I tear it down anyway, You'd be in what trouble. Happens? You'd be in trouble. How much trouble would I be in? <laughs> they might arrest you. <laughs> oh, really? But not only that, you would get fined a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, there's you know, a lot the, of uh, ramifications. Well, in the news last year in San Francisco, yeah. there was the Neutra House that the guy didn't even go get a demolition permit. He just tore it down. Tore it down. Yeah. And I think he's ending up paying like a few thousand dollar penalty and it just So what? Yeah, yeah. that's so that's so bad. So I'm I'm a big yeah. advocate for, you know, rules with teeth because if you're going to go to all that trouble to designate something, you want to really protect it. Yes. In, in yeah. my state North Carolina, all we have is preservation easements mm -hmm. that have any kind of legal enforcement power. Going sure, for it. sure. But I'm glad yeah. to hear you have something out well, here that's a yes. little more. Yes, and, and peer pressure and your neighbors and people and uh, the community. Uh, you, yeah. might, you might not survive if you do something <laughs> bad. Did the Maslons survive after they tore their house down? Uh, well, their heirs uh, sold the house. Okay. So the Maslons had passed away. Yeah. And their heirs owned the house and they sold it. And unfortunately, there weren't those rules or regulations at yeah. that time. So it was. So that's our. our if big you're interested wicket. in reading about this, you can look up on our site usmodernist.org/neutra, and read about the Maslon House. And uh, also, Dion Neutra wrote in a couple of his books uh, photos of the house mm -hmm. and of the destruction when it came by. And it was one of the things that made the international news when that house went away. Catherine, thank you so much for dropping by and chatting with me. It's been such a pleasure to meet you in person. Thank you. My pleasure. Fun talking with you. That was Catherine Huff, former chief curator at the Palm Springs Museum of Art. Stay tuned over the spring and summer as we bring you more shows from 2020's Modernism Week in Palm Springs. You want to hang out with us at the swanky U.S. Modernist Compound at Modernism Week in February 2021? Email george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by nichiha.com slash usmodernist and by Angela Roll, your special agent for modernist houses, 919-995-0550. All right, George, it's your turn to take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 significant modernist houses, and access 2.8 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studio in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by me and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino researches guests while juggling two children, a bowling ball, and a flaming torch, all <laughs> while blues dancing with husband Adam. Wow. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm George Smart, and there's no Frank Sinatra tune that doesn't play well under the stars with a martini in Palm Springs. We'll be back soon with another Almost Like Being in Love, The Way You Look Tonight, and The Best is Yet to Come edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Cheers. Cheers to you too.